So what I did tonight was I just wanted to talk to you about religious leaders questioning Jesus. In uh, Mark chapter 12, from verses 13 through 34, there are three questions. Uh, and uh, these three questions come from three different groups. And so what I wanted to do was as we, before we looked at the questions, I wanted you to look at the groups. The first question is going to come from the uh, Pharisees, and uh, they had some distinctiveness to them. The uh, second question is going to come from the Sadducees, and they have some distinctives to them that help us to understand their question, as well as the Pharisees. Understanding them helps us to understand their question. And then the scribes. And if you notice when you read through here, of these three questions, only two of them are really confrontational. The third one, when Jesus responds and answers, uh, the scribes pretty much affirm him. And we'll see that and we'll see why in, in just a moment. But just so that, and, and this is what you have in your, in your outline as well, just so that we get an, a, a clear understanding about the questions themselves, I want you to see that the, the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and I went to the, the internet uh, to get, get a lot of the uh, distinctionness, and, and I found uh, several different comparisons that I was able to meld together and help me with some of the things that you have written there. What I learned was that the Pharisees of, of these three groups, the Pharisees was, most, was the most popular among the people. Pharisees were comprised of, of businessmen as well as religious uh, priests and, and, and folks who uh, worked alongside the people. And so they had a little bit more respect of the people. They were middle class as, uh, and as I indicated there, respected by the people. Uh, they were more engaging with the synagogues. Now, the synagogues are that which was in the outlying areas. Jerusalem was the, was the main headquarters for worship with the temple. But for the areas outside, especially up in Galilee, since Jerusalem was down in Judea, and the temple was down there, and people couldn't always travel to Jerusalem to, as we would say, go to church. Uh, the synagogue came out of that period between the Testaments. Between the Old Testament and the New Testament was the development of the synagogue. And the synagogue served as that place where they probably began to learn how to have their, their, their uh, worship time when they were in exile. And then when they began to come back and they just continued wherever they were able to set up, they could set up a synagogue uh, wherever there was 10 or more Jewish males present. Uh, they didn't care a lot for the religious leaders there in Jerusalem. They didn't care a lot for the Sadducees. And uh, we'll see as we get further along in, in our study in Acts that there is a, 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 a conflict between Sadducees and Pharisees and Paul actually takes advantage of it. Because uh, whereas the Pharisees were more over the synagogue, the uh, Sadducees are going to be more over the temple. They were considered religious conservatives, but as we find through the scriptures, and especially when Jesus talks about them, to the point of legalism where they were more in, engaged or more concerned with the letter of the law than they were the spirit of the law. When you begin to look at the Sermon on the Mount, you see Jesus distinguishing. He says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, and he dealt with the spirit of the law. And so as such, they were considered conservative, but it was almost to the point of legalism. But at the same time, they also added to their understanding of the scriptures. Whereas they, we would have looked at them as being maybe legalistic or fundamental in their in their stance, they were also very liberal in their theology because they would incorporate as part of their authority things that weren't in the Torah. They're the ones that, that helped develop the tradition of the elders, the, law, the oral law, the hedge around the law. And these are the things that they kept accusing Jesus of breaking whenever he would do something on the Sabbath. They would, they would try to... because. He would be breaking not the Torah, not the law. He would be breaking their traditions, the tradition of the elders. 
So they were religious conservatives to the point of legalism, but they accepted more than just the word of God. They accepted the interpretations, the traditions of the elders, and the oral law. Now, one of the things to their merit is that they believed in both the resurrection and the afterlife. Now, this is going to be a distinguishing factor between them and the Sadducees, because as we indicated before, Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and that is why they are sad, you see. The, uh, uh, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection, and they didn't believe in afterlife. And this will come out in their question. I found it very interesting that their question had to do with the resurrection when they didn't believe in the resurrection. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to the questions. That brings us to the Sadducees. The Sadducees, whereas the, the Pharisees were middle class, the Sadducees were upper class. They were more interested in the aristocracy, and that also gave them a connection not only with the upper crust of society, but also they were very political. And being of a wealth well worldview, they were more interested in power than they were in the, the goings-on of man. And so as a result, they were a big part of the power struggle that Jesus would face when they would ask the question, by what authority are you doing these things? The Sadducees saw him as a threat to their power, a threat to their authority. And their, and their question is gonna, going to, to deal with challenging his theology just to try to get them, the people, not to accept him in his power and his popularity. Uh, as I mentioned already, they, they tend to control the temple. They were, they were pretty much more concerned with Jerusalem. And by the way, this, uh, this engagement in power also put them in, in very close connection with Rome. Do you remember at the, uh, the trial when Jesus is before Pilate and there were those that were from the crowd, from the Sanhedrin, that were saying, Pilate, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar? There was a connection between the Sadducees and their quest for power and Rome, who was the power that was in place at that time. And so they, wanted, they didn't want to upset Rome, and they would try to use Rome in order to accomplish their, their ends, which in this case was to, to crucify the Lord of glory. And that's why they, they were there to tell Pilate, you're no friend of Caesar's if you do this. If you let this man go. Uh, they were religious liberals in that they rejected the resurrection. They, they rejected angels, demons, the, astrolo- the afterlife. Uh, they just uh, didn't believe in those things. They, they went strictly by the Torah. If the, and if the Torah said it, that was, that was final. And to them, the Torah didn't talk about resurrection. So they didn't involve themselves with it, even though Job would refer to it. You know, Job would, would talk about, uh, about the resurrection. Um, and we'll see how, when Jesus answers them, how he tries to correct their misunderstandings about these, these particular subjects. And as I mentioned, they, they were politically connected to Rome. The scribes are probably the more harmless of these three groups at this point. What they were, were they were the, the, the ones who were most connected to the Word of God. They meticulously copied it. They were the scribes. They became the interpreters of it for the people. They were the major uh, interpreters. They had a very high view of the Torah, very high view of the Word of God, and that is also reflected in their question. So, when we start in verse 13, and I just invite you to to look at the passage with me, we're in, in Mark chapter 12, and beginning at verse 13, it says, Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. They're still trying to trap him. And when they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and you care about no one for you do not regard the person of men but teach the way of God and truth so we ask you 
Is it awful? Is it, excuse me, not awful. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? I, I guess my own feelings was coming through, wasn't it? <laughs> is it awful to pay taxes? Yes, it is awful to pay taxes. But the scripture says, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Notice that their question is focused upon an outward activity that can be pointed to and be looked at because that's primarily what they're most concerned about, the outward appearance. What is Jesus going to say to them? You guys, you clean the, in, the outside of the cup, but you leave the inside filthy. You're more concerned with the out, outer appearance. You're like uh, white as sepulchers. You, you're whitewashed on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You're more concerned with the outward appearance and how things look than you are with the inward man. And so they're asking a very uh, practical question, and they're hoping to trap him up. That's what it said earlier. They were hoping to trap him up because they knew that taxes weren't popular with the people. So if they could get him to say, oh, yes, by all means, uh, make sure your your, uh, 1040s are in by by April 15th uh, and that they are done meticulously and honestly and with all full integrity. Um, Jesus does an interesting thing in answering them. He helps the, to try to move the question from a physical outward expression to an inward spiritual expression. Watch what he does. Yeah, you, you know what he does. You, you've seen this before. He... Uh, he says to them, he says, well, <clears throat> why, are you, why are you putting me to the test? And he, it says, he, knowing their hypocrisy. And then he just says, bring me a coin, bring me a denarius, then I may see it. Now, by the way, this is not the first time Jesus has ever dealt with taxes. When they came to town one time, he had, uh, they had a tax to pay. And uh, he told Peter, just go on down to the seashore, go fishing. First fish you catch. Open his mouth. There you'll find exactly what we need. God will provide for your taxes. So don't sweat it. He says, show me a coin. They showed him a coin. He says, okay, now, uh, tell me, whose picture is this on, on the coin? And they said, well, and of course, I'm not real sure they understood where he was going. But he was, he was laying a trap back for them. He knew their hypocrisy. They said, well, that's the picture of Caesar. He says, okay. If his picture's on it, it belongs to him, give it to him. It's his coin. Jesus was just was trying to say, you know, you're, you're wanting me to say something that, that can trap me, but I'm just going to say, why don't you just give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's? And then he added this. And by the way, give to God the things that are God's. Is his imprint on here? If it is, give it to God. And he moved them from a physical outward activity to an inward development of character and decision about to whether or not they belonged to God. Because he was dealing with the hypocrisy of their hearts. Not just that they would require the people to do something they weren't willing to do. That, that's part of it. But, but also they were more interested in outward things than they were about inward things. So that was the first question. And that's what they were dealing with. Uh, the Pharisees, it was a question of outward compliance. Pharisees were more concerned about how things look on the outside. This is what I put on, on, on your sheet. Was it right to pay taxes to Rome? His response was to turn the outward obedience into inward obedience. One could see your obedience in paying taxes. I get that. But the only way they're going to see your obedience and obey your obedience to God is when your life begins to reflect the things that God values. You, you've picked something that everybody values, this coin. Well, this coin's not near as important as your life. And so, yeah, you know, go ahead and give the, give the coin. Give it to Caesar. That's no big deal. Give this to God. That 
is a bigger deal. So that was the first question. The first question was, is it lawful to pay Texas taxes to Caesar? The second question was, okay, what about the resurrection? And this is, uh, this is going to be seen in verses 18 through uh, 27. Some of the Sadducees who say there are no resurrection came to him and they asked him. And, and see, it already gives you their, their bias right there at the beginning. Some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, that's their belief, came to him and they asked him. And they said, teacher, Moses wrote us that if a man... If a man's brother dies and leaves his wife behind and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, this is not going to be a question about marriage. This is a question about the resurrection. But they've clothed it in an Old Testament law about marriage. And they're using an Old Testament law about marriage to bring up a, a question at the end that they don't even believe themselves. Look what he says. So, uh, man takes a uh, man takes a wife. He leaves his wife behind. Leaves no children. His brother should take the wife, raise up the offspring. Verse twenty. Now there were seven brothers. First took a wife, dying. He left no offspring. Second took her, died. Nor did he leave any offspring. Third, likewise. Seven. The seven had her, and left no offspring. Now. That sounds like a marriage question, but it's not a marriage question for them. It's, uh, it's an exaggerated situation. This was not something that, that would have normally happened, but they've made an, taken an exaggerated situation, and they've made a point out of it. Last of all, the woman died. So, here's our question. In the resurrection... And you can almost hear them, if there is one. In the resurrection, and we don't believe there is, but if there is one, when they rise up, as you claim they will, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as a wife. And in an attempt to try to make a, a logical argument for not marriage and, the, and, the, and what the law was saying about raising up children, but about the resurrection. They pose this question. And I love Jesus' answer. <laughs> Are you not therefore mistaken? You got it all wrong. Your question, the very foundation of your question, is getting it all wrong. Why? Because you're assuming from the beginning there is no resurrection. And your whole question is bent on, is there a resurrection? But you won't come out and say that. You're going to design this, this preposterous story as an example, a philosophical example, of why there probably is no resurrection. He says, as a result, you're mistaken because you do not know the scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. In their effort to try to say there was no resurrection, even though they were held fast to the Torah, he says, you, you're mistaken because you don't understand the very scriptures you say you believe. In the book of Exodus, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, God said to Moses, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God of Israel. And yet these men had long since died. He didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, or I was the God of Jacob, or I was the God, uh, I mean, of Isaac, and, or I was the God of Jacob. He says, I am. Which should tell you that these three men are still living. They have died physically, but they still live because there is a resurrection. And he says, you don't know the Scriptures, nor do you know the power of God. And I think this is fascinating because he, he says, you, you don't know the Scriptures and you don't know the power of God. When they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead that rise, have you not read in the book of Moses in the burning bush passage how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? He's not the God of the dead. 
but the God of the living. So I'll tell you again, you guys are wrong. You're dead wrong. With no hope of resurrection. (laughs) You're mistaken in your theology. And you tried to trap me in a question that you knew nothing about. Because there is a resurrection. And that's what he was trying to say. Um, he says, you, 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 you illustrated their misun- he, in, he, he illustrated their misunderstanding of the word of God, but then he will illustrate the power of God in about four more days when he himself will rise from the dead. And imagine what all these Sadducees are going to say then. If there is no resurrection, behold my hands and my feet. For it is I myself. He, he wasn't just going to be proving to his disciples. He was going to be proving to those who had taken their position of Scripture. And he was going to prove them again wrong. This time of questioning is not just extra material for us. There is significance in these questions. And there's significance in his answers. The third question was done by the scribes. And it was basically, which is the first commandment of all? Now, it would be easy for you to say, oh, well, but the first commandment was that you shall have no other gods before me. Because when you think of the Ten Commandments, that's the first commandment. But that's not what was being asked, and that's not what he answered. He didn't answer the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. One of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Not of the ten. And so it's not the first numerically that he's asking for. He says, what is the primary commandment? What is the first and foremost commandment? And being a scribe and an interpreter of the Old Testament Scriptures, he, he knew what he was looking to hear. And he heard it. And by the way, this is the same question that Jesus will ask a lawyer in Luke 15. When the, when the lawyer says, you know, uh, how can I inherit eternal life? And he says, well, what does it say? What do, you, what do you read? How do you read it? And he says, well, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind and your strength. You love your neighbors yourself. Jesus says, that's right. And then he asks the question, well, who's my neighbor? And then we get into the story of the Good Samaritan. In that instance, in Luke 15, Jesus asked the lawyer. And the lawyer answered the very same thing that Jesus is about to answer. Verse 29, Jesus answered and said, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And, by the way, the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus said basically the same thing that the lawyer said to him when he asked him the question, how do you read it? And uh, that's what was said. Notice that the scribe does not argue and does not rebuttal. He doesn't try to contradict Jesus. If anything, he affirms him. The scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You've spoken the truth. Of these three questions, he's the only one that really accepts the answer. For there is one God and there is no other but he, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now he's even gone further, and guess what Jesus says to him? Full marks. You got it right. When Jesus saw that, he answered wisely. He said to him, You're not far from the kingdom of God. These three questions, two of them were sent to trap him. One affirmed him. And it was the scribe. Now, does that mean all scribes were going to be good in his book? No. No, they, they, they made their mistakes as well. But 
In this situation, the scribe didn't argue or rebuttal. He acknowledged that Jesus had a grasp on what the core of the scriptures said, and he affirmed him. And that is why, verse 34, after that, no one dared question him. That is why the question stopped at that point. And the next week we get together, we'll look at the question Jesus has for them. Because he turns around and starts questioning them. And I think it's significant. I, I think uh, when I started looking at this, I thought, you know what? I, I hope I get time to share it. If not, I'll just do it next week. But I liked this study. Uh, we looked at uh, last Sunday the three warnings that Paul received uh, about not going to Jerusalem. Tonight we looked at three questions that Jesus received right before his passion. This next Sunday, we're going to look at three misunderstandings that set the wheels in motion for Paul's imprisonment. We're going to look at truth, and we're going to look at misunderstandings. I hope you'll make it a point to be here next Sunday morning. Let's pray.